This is episode 139 of Let's Talk Geek, your weekly dose for everything geeky. I'm Jan Vermeulen. Joining me in studio today, we have Luke. Hello. We have Annie behind the mixing desk. Hello. Thank you very much for joining me. In the show, we're talking about the Ig Nobel Awards. They're in sweet terminal emulators on GitHub. And the Vodacom Neotel deal could go south quite easily, it seems. Thanks for joining us. Catch you right after the intro roll thingy. Cue the intro. All right, so first up, we start the show off with a random, and this is courtesy of the IRC. Thank you very much to MCD in the IRC, who gave us the fact, I guess, that 139 is a significant number of episodes for a series to have. So let's start with Chips. Uh, a series that ran on NBC from 1977 <laughs> to 1983. The year I was born, incidentally, 1983. And uh, I, I don't really want to say more about Chips because there's more awesome. Another series that ran for 139 episodes is Third Rock from the Sun, also an NBC series. Now, Third Rock from the Sun is significant, not, not just because John Lithgow is awesome, but because it also um, uh, started off the career, I'd say, of Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who yeah. is... Awesome. Indeed. Correct. Yeah. And then, far most importantly, is an ABC series, MacGyver. 139 episodes. Woo! I reckon that if you reach the milestone of 139 episodes and you can... Stand toe to toe with MacGyver in terms of how long you've run. That's pretty good. Look at our young Richard Dean Anderson is in that picture. <laughs> Holy crap! I'm a big MacGyver fan. Yeah. So. Ma MacGyver is like the ultimate geek. We've I'd never, say. we've never, we've never segmented our show into seasons though. So we yes, but it's 139 episodes across all seasons. So no, we haven't. But it's four, four it years. is irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> So, welcome to episode 139, a number we're sharing with MacGyver. All right. So, first up is the Quick Geek. This is the part of the show where we try to blast through some topics, two minutes per topic. The mixer keeps us honest, though she doesn't have a timer on it. She's going to do it by the magnetic compass in her head. And When are we going to win, mixer? When are we going to win? <laughs> Soon. <laughs> All right, so first up, um, Annie and I got to go to iWeek, and Luke insisted that we give some... Tell me <laughs> how it went. All right, so um, what happened at iWeek, for those of you who haven't watched our previous episodes, Corey Doctorow came to South Africa, and he was, he was brought here, I think, by um, the, the, the ISPA guys, the people who, who arranged iWeek, and um, he chaired a panel, and he spoke, he delivered the keynote on the Thursday, iWeek as the name suggests, runs for a week. Um, it is affiliated with the Internet Service Provider Association of, uh, of South Africa, hence iWeek, and, um, and he delivered the keynote on the Thursday. And the article I ended up doing, and, and perhaps Annie should say what stood out for her, is that uh, Corey Doctorow said that South Africa's national ID card system, the biometric ID card system we're, we're, just, we're rolling out right now, is a really bad idea. This would then also couple with what Stallman had to say as well. Exactly. Yes. So, so, so Richard Stallman is, is opposed to all kinds of national <laughs> identification, let alone a card that stores your biometric data. Sure. Um, but um, Stallman takes a more principled approach um, that a national ID card ends up becoming a de facto membership card for things and your national identifier becomes a de facto identifier for everything, which is exactly what we have in South Africa. Um, and I think, but I also think that dismantling that in South Africa at this stage think is an incredibly tall order. We have gotten used to the idea. I mean, if you were a country that didn't have to carry around IDs and stuff, I'm sure you would also have a problem. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's just natural. Well, uh, like, for example, the U.S. doesn't have a national ID yes. system, and so they've got this social security number, which is not meant to be used as a, unique, a global unique identifier, yeah. right? Well, what they do have, though, is state-issued IDs. Some states issue IDs, yes. So well, you have you government photo go, IDs. You There's can't actually go vote if you don't have a state-issued ID. So, some of them have voter IDs, but it differs from state to state. Yeah. There, there, there was like a big voter ID thing earlier in the year. I don't want to yeah, get yeah. into American politics. There's, but there's no federal ID system. Yes. yes. If you wanted to 
get into a bar, you would have to use state issued ID. Well, yeah, a dry, like a, or driver's, a driver's license. license. Yeah. Um, and Cory Doctorow's stance is a little, um, a little more technical. I would say a little more pragmatic. Um, his his problem is that biometrics are actually a really poor authentication token um, because they clone themselves really, really easily and they are irrevocable. Yes. So in other words, if your authentication token is compromised, unlike a certificate, um, which we use online, you cannot issue a re revocation command. Um, you could burn your fingerprints off. But <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. Yeah. You're not going to get a new set. You have you have one set of biometrics. Yeah. Yeah. You have and, one DNA, and and one set of fingerprints, like, one retina. Like certain people who have long hair, leave them all, leave <laughs> it all over the place. Yeah. And your fingerprints are left all over the place. Ew. So so they clone themselves, um, which is where he gets that from. And so he he used a little <laughs> anecdote where um, in order to protest biometric biometrics as an uh, as like a state identification mechanism, <clears throat> or as a or as being useful for any kind of important identification, a bunch of hackers in the United States, they had a, an important speaker coming to DEF CON, and, um, and what they did was they lifted his fingerprints off of, you know, <laughs> whatever he touched, the podium <laughs> or a glass of a water, glass of water and cool. they duplicated it and slipped it into a, um, in, in, as po into a magazine cover. So like a hacker magazine, they distributed it with this guy's fingerprints. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. But on top of it, like they used something incredibly incriminating, um, that they made it look like he was trying to kill people who bought... <laughs> this magazine, effectively, uh, like you know, ma uh, envelope of white powder, or you know, oh, some, okay, some okay, equivalent okay. of that. Yeah. Um, and, and his fingerprints were all, all over the envelope. So, um, yeah. <laughs> all in all, uh, it, it, I must uh, say it was it was a very interesting talk. I'd never really thought of biometrics in that way. Um, not you, biometrics in IRC. Uh, biometrics, as in, <laughs> as in these exactly. <laughs> um, and yeah, now that I think about it. Um, you know, security people always tell you that uh, like a great security token is or, or you, you use security tokens that uh, to have like multi-factor authentication, sure. something you know, something yes. you are and something you, that you have. Yes. Um, and so biometrics is, you know, like something yeah. you are, for example. Um, but um, that's actually quite it turns out that that's actually quite weak um, as authentication tokens go. Well, I guess it's an argument for another day, but we could also talk about like the new iPhone with its fingerprint reading stuff. Um, and, and lots of speculation around that, that it's going to become like a very, very quick and easy uh, fingerprinting um, sure. uh, farm for things like the NSA. But I also have other concerns. Yeah. Like I am the person with the finger that is now authenticating on my phone or whatever. So if they do store that fingerprint somewhere else, which I'm not entirely convinced that they aren't doing or despite whatever they're, they're saying, uh, who owns that information? Does Apple own it because it now resides on their servers? Or you yeah. as generator of the data, do you still retain ownership of and, that? And, that's, and I think that's a valid question. Um, uh, an important point to make here is that your bio... Apple said specifically that your biometric data is not sent over the internet okay. anywhere. It is stored in like a super secret encrypted spot in a new A7 chip um, specifically designed for this. Um, but yeah, um, what kind I of... I don't trust you. Well, <laughs> you, you, you. Exactly. What does it say in the end user license agreement about yes. who owns that data, right? I would love data, to right? read that part of the, the license agreement. Yeah. So a valid question and I think something worth checking out when the iPhone 5S launches. Sure. Um, I'm going to move us along on to the Ig Nobel Awards. I always look forward to these every year and I missed them. So you thank you, Luke. missed an entire section. On Your iWeek? Yes. What did I miss? You talked about Corey's <laughs> talk, but you didn't talk about anything else. Oh, are you waiting for me to lead into the photos? Yes. Just uh, show okay. the photos. For those of you watching the video stream right now, <laughs> um, we got to spend an afternoon with Corey Doctorow. It was really, well, an hour, two hours with Corey Doctorow um, while, hey, the, the ISPA, <laughs> while the ISPA AGM was going on. So ne none of us were invited to the ISPA AGM for obvious reasons. We were um, invited. We just decided not to go. No, I was, I'm definitely not allowed in the ISPA AGM. Definitely not. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> anyway, um, 
but uh, yeah, it was it was a really really cool afternoon. And uh, for those of you watching the the only having the audio stream right now, what the video people are seeing is Corey and I looking incredibly pensive. And it is a photo taken by the lovely Annie who was sitting behind the mixing desk. But it was not only I who got to spend uh, two hours in the afternoon with Corey. Annie got to spend some time with him as well. Yeah, I have to Very say, nice. um, he is an incredibly eloquent, affable guy. He just he speaks so well. So likable as well, yeah. And, uh, and I can just sit and listen to him talk. And, and he's one of the best speakers I've heard in a long time. And yeah. I'm pretty sure that that comes from his experiences as a science fiction writer, which a lot of people try to use to discredit him when he tries to make arguments. But it makes him such an incredibly good speaker. So, yeah, we had a really great afternoon. We had, uh, we had some drinks with him, and he gave us some cool stickers, and he gave me a, a, a jackhammer jewel pin. Um, and That's Boing Boing's, uh, Boing Boing's mascot. Very nice. mascot. And uh, yeah, and showed me. Um, yeah, he dug through his bag and showed us some of the awesome stuff he had around. Was just you know, messing around. He's anonymous. Like he he's got a WD forty pen. Uh, I don't know oh, why what? we don't have WD forty pens in this country, but somebody needs to import that stuff. Um, uh, so that said, pro- probably, I mean, not that he needs a free plug from us, but a free plug nonetheless. His books are actually available as Creative Commons downloads. This is a guy who practices what he preaches. They're very, they're very good. Yeah. yeah. It, it's quite readable stuff. It's mostly young adult science yes. fiction, I'd say. Um, so if you're into that sort of thing, uh, like Harry Potter and John Green and those guys come to mind as young adult authors, Cor- Cory Doctorow f- definitely fits into that genre, um, except his stuff is science fiction. And um, and this and um, like Richard Stallman, though perhaps a little less fundamentalist, he practices what he preaches. His, he he does not only sell his books, though they are for sale. You can yes. buy them in bookshops. You can buy them as eBooks. He also has them available as free downloads, licensed under Creative Commons. And so if you're I interested, asked him, asked him Google that, that stuff and go and check it out. I asked him about that. I said, you know, if you give your books away for free, how do you make any money? And he said. He asks people to pay for them if they like them. So. The Ig Nobel Awards were on the 12th. <laughs> Luke, um, I always look forward to these every year, and I miss these, so thank you very much for spotting them. Um, they were on the 12th. Yeah. And what happened this year? Well, first let's start. What are the Ig Nobel Awards? So, like the Nobel Awards, these awards are awards that you give to folk to... Uh, you know, recognize their accomplishments, even though the topics that they might have been researching are not the world's most noble themselves. Uh, so here from the Wikipedia page, the stated aim of the prizes is to honor the achievements of what's it, that make us laugh and then make us think. So uh, <laughs> very cool. What, what um, the, the stuff that I, the research that I always enjoy the most out of the Ig Nobel Awards are the things that people think is obvious. But, yes. you know, we, we all make the assumption that this is true and it probably is true, but no one has ever proved that it's true. So something that comes to mind is the fact that uh, basically research that states that um, the, the, the people that are most confident in their abilities or that it actually turns out that people that are incompetent are, more, are most confident in their abilities. Yes. It's actually, yeah. Uh, and this year is along the similar vein. I mean, in the biology section, we have uh, people doing studies on uh, you... When you're drunk, you think you're sexy, and it's proven. <laughs> and it's proven scientifically <laughs> that you will think that way. Uh, That's although, great. There were a few kickers. It's brilliant. I think read the article yourself. I've linked it in the IRC to the peeps over there. Cool. And um, it'll be in the show yeah. notes for those of you uh, catching the show after the fact. Um, but, yeah, uh, they're amusing. They're great fun to read. Um, I always look forward to seeing them every year. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Uh, this was interesting in the biology and just one more thing um, yeah. in the biology and astronomy section uh, Ig Nobel winning study by Marie Dack and colleagues showed that dung beetles use the Milky Way for navigational orientation previously it was believed they use the moon but the study reveals it's not just that very interesting reminds me of um, birds that actually navigate by having quantum entangled uh, uh, particles, I think, in their heads. Go, go and read up on how humans are able to smell. It's okay. a brilliant read as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And the safety engineering ignoble went to Gustavo Pizzo for inv- inventing an elaborate system to foil airline hijackers, which involved activating a trapdoor they fall through where they're sealed in a special container, which is then dropped from the plane with a parachute to be collected by pre-warned police on the ground. It's rather elaborate, isn't it? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> this is why I love the Ig Nobel Awards. Yes. They're awesome. Go and check them out. Does the trapdoor move around? <laughs> <laughs> it's a portable hole. Excellent. Um, then something I picked up uh, probably about two weeks ago, but we haven't had a show in a while, is that nothing we don't already know. I should, get in, I should be uh, nominated for an Ig Nobel, I think. The US patent system still sucks. Um, and the, the question is, why don't we just make this thing in South Africa? So I'll link you guys in the IRC to this now. What I'm talking about is effectively a MagSafe connector for headphones. So how many times have you had it so that your, okay. your headphones um, s- snag on something and they either pull out or yank your phone out and fling it around somewhere? It's happened to me on at least a couple Very of occasions. Times, yeah. Um, and so what this connect, what's great about this connector is it attaches to your existing headphone jack and headphone connector. So the standard 9mm jack. Yes. So you don't have to have, unlike the Apple MagSafe connector for their power thing, you don't have to have a specially made connector for this to work. This is just an adapter. And um, it turns out that a US patent is basically going to make this impossible. Um, The person who thought this up um, took it to a number of companies. I think Bose was one of them. Oh, wow. um, To have this made. There was a lot of interest. And then after a patent search, they said, um, sorry, there's just uh, no way we're going to enter this quagmire. And surprisingly, it's not Apple's MagSafe patent that's the problem. Um, there is. Gonna, uh, oh, sorry, they I'm didn't go guess to, It's a connector. That's yeah, going to be the problem. Yeah. It's not Bose. It's Belkin that they okay. went to. So also a big company. Um, they specifically called out U.S. patent. I'm not going to name these numbers. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they are. Uh, none of them are actually making these these things that have been patented. Oh, so they just patent something. Yeah. Okay. Cool. You know it's how obvious. it is, right? Damn, there yeah. You go. Exactly. Nice. So. Um, that that is the unfortunate state of the patent system, um, yeah. So a bit of a sad. Uh, the the sad thing is that uh, I, I guess what that means is sadly for us we won't be seeing. This is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> we can't have MagSafe <laughs> headphone connectors. On on the topic of headphones and uh, companies like Falcon and Bose, um, there was some interesting news earlier this week that. Uh, sad news that uh, Ray Dolby, the father oh, yeah. of uh, what's it? Dolby Digital. Modern, yeah. Well, the, basically, he is the father of modern noise. Something. Is it noise cancellation? Uh, it's like sound stereoscopy or something the like pioneer that. Pioneer of recorded sound is what yeah. the modern Washington Post. Modern noise reduction. Yeah, okay. Yeah. In R. So Ray, yeah. Ray Dolby, the father of modern, modern noise reduction, has died at the age of eighty. Good innings, very sad, and I believe a point for you for being interesting. Well done, Mixer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we, we have points now? <laughs> I have points, you don't have any points. <laughs> All right. Um, then, um, Luke, uh, you, you had the next one. Um, so, since my show notes are hanging, thank you, Google Drive, will you just take it from here? <laughs> it's the USB condom, and th- it doesn't... It isn't actually as cool as it sounds or as weird as it sounds. Uh, it, it's a proposed mechanism of why haven't we built anything like this yet. And all it is is it's a, it's a device that you plug into your computer and you then plug in your devices or phones or whatever you want to charge or something into that device. And what happens is that the computer will not be able to see this device, but you can still charge the device at the same time. Aha! And then you're going to tell me, but Luke, why not just kill off the data pins on the USB connection? And the simple answer is is that, well, a lot of devices negotiate at the speed at which they can charge or the parameters at which they can charge. So you still need that information to flow through. Uh, So it's just a simple... Ah, you know, so when the PC or whatever pops up a message yeah. to say, hey, hey, this PC can't deliver the current needed to yes. charge this device, that's the kind of data it yes. needs. So it still provides that data throughput without giving you the actual data that the, the, you know, the phone or whatever you're trying to charge over the phone, uh, over the wire, is trying to negotiate for. Yeah, so that's yeah. very cool. I mean, why haven't we had this before? Uh, 
I mean, I know at like the office, I've got a USB hub, for instance, that yeah. I set to charge all of my devices off of. Yeah, I must be honest. It's not something I've actually given a lot of thought to. It's not something I've said, oh, that is something that I need. But yeah, now, yeah. now that somebody says they've bought well, this thing, I need it. Yeah, but I must now you, have can it. Tr- you can charge untrusted devices, no yes. problem. So, yeah. very cool. Or devices that, for whatever reason, uh, cause... Uh, Unwanted programs to oh, yes, pop up like, like iTunes, <coughs> um, rogue keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for example, so many, so many things um, that uh, that go wrong. Um, so uh, then the the other thing that that I wanted to mention is uh, an article that I thought was quite interesting. I haven't read the the whole thing, and I'll, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> is um, an oral history of Apple design starting from 1992. Um, so, um, what this is about, um, is that the, uh, well, this is an article that ran on fast co-design, but not the full article. So this is an in-depth look. What these guys have done is they have gone to Apple staffers and people familiar with the Apple design story and interviewed them, hence oral history, a lot of legwork, a lot of efforts, a lot of hours spent on not okay. only gathering the information but crafting the article. And so a, a small portion of the article is on fast co-design okay. and the rest of it is hosted on a service called byliner.com. And as a journalist, this thing interested me. And what byliner.com does is it, uh, it's a service that purports um, to, you know, or, or that claims that it is aggregating uh, good content from all over the web some of it freely available, some okay. of it not, and um, also has it for sale. Um, and then what you do is you buy a subscription to Byliner.com, and things that are exclusive to Byliner, you can then, you can then read with a subscription. Um, okay. And if you don't have a subscription, you can only read the free content. And they've Fair got uh, the, uh, what else is interesting about this is it's not just new articles. They've got articles dating back to the early 90s ah. that they have digitized and have available on the platform. Some of them freely available. Uh, you don't have to pay to access them. So I think it's a very interesting model. I don't know if it's going to work. Um, maybe it does. Maybe Let's there's see. enough demand for something like yeah. this. Um, you know, to, to, to have an alternative model to just the standard tried and tested model. advertising model. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was, uh, that was quite, an interesting, quite an interesting little development. Um, uh, you know, the interesting article aside, uh, but an, but an, uh, an interesting development uh, on, the, you know, on the part of – in journalism. That's pretty um, cool. Yeah. Then uh, something you picked up on, Luke, is Disney turning your earlobe into a speaker. Now, I know – watches turning, you know, having speaker systems on them and having sort of cup speakers at the end of the watch and all kinds of strange I things. Find, this is new. I find the idea of Disney lately has been strange. They've been developing a lot of technology. Um, and this is one of these devices, which is it's kind of crazy where you take a standard microphone and you record a message to a computer. And what the computer does is it will then using the same microphone that you input the sound through, uh, you amplify the, the sound back through the microphone while, while you hold it in your okay. hand. And then with your other hand, you go and touch someone's earlobe. And what happens as a crazy byproduct uh, is that only that person can hear what's going on. So it's like the ultimate whisper. It is the ultimate whisper. Hmm. Uh, it's very creepy. Um, I would love to know what you would use this for. <laughs> uh, but uh, I can imagine like secret like agencies and things would be using this kind of stuff. Uh, it's very cool. Yeah. Um, okay. That's quite interesting. And it, it, might even, it might even lead to other developments. I mean, if you've got um, something that can be transmitted through the earlobe yeah. into the ear, then maybe there are techniques to do that. You know, remotely. Yes. So they propose that maybe you can get an implant or something that can act as a like a Star Trek communicator or something to, for the same kind of effect, but okay. wirelessly. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's neato. Yeah, yeah. Then um, something I got linked to earlier in the week is Yorick. I knew him well. It is uh, J O R one K. 
or uh, the uh, an OR1000 JavaScript emulator running Linux. I'll uh, bomb the link into IRC, and it'll be available in the show notes. Um, it's exactly what it says. It is a it is a piece of JavaScript that that downloads a seven megabyte disk image compressed to your machine. It gets decompressed at your end, and it runs a fully fledged Linux system in your browser. In your browser, you can make a fest to make file systems. Mount the file How? system. <laughs> <laughs> ASM.js apparently. It is some seriously. So no, wait a minute. Where where does it put the disk image? Is it like a RAM image or? A um, I I don't know. Like I'd have to go and look at the code, but I would guess in the browser cache. Yes, that's the only place that's available to download it to. Sure, that's creepy. <laughs> that's very creepy. And it's really small. Yes. Yes. Uh, sounds like a Minix type thing. Um, so um, the the version I've got the. Uh, I've got the, the version, I think, being displayed there. It is open. It's a blinking bash console. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's full on bash. Um, I can't see from here what that is, but it's... Uh, open risk dash 12. Okay, there we go. Thank you, the mixer. Um, oh, there we go. Th- that's, well, a that's a CPU. Sorry, so yeah. And then you can Linux say Linux open, open risk. 3.11.0 RC. So that'll tell you what, what version of Linux it's running as well. Dirty. The brain is boggled. How? How? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good stuff. And this is not the end of the terminal awesomeness, but we'll get to that. <laughs> um, something you picked up on, Luke, is the world's mm. thinnest touch surface keyboard. So this keyboard, uh, for those of you who can see it, um, links, of course, in the usual places. Uh, what makes it unique is that it's just about as thin as a human hair. Um, wow. Wow. <laughs> And, uh, so it's quite flexible, I would imagine. It's quite flexible. It's, um, it's a capacitive touch system. So the idea is that they, wanted, they thought that on-screen keyboards were crap uh, they are. for tablets and things like that. So the idea is just to uh, have something that you could put in the sleeve of like your, your tablet's cover or something to that effect and to have it Bluetooth wirelessly you know, let you type on the keyboard or have a simple touchpad and those kinds of things. Um, how the hell they get it that thin is amazing. Um, And uh, something the mixer brought up uh, before the show is, is this related to um, that accidental discovery uh, they made earlier? Like, what's it, the thinnest piece of glass? Yeah, so some scientists accidentally uh, produced the world's thinnest sheet of glass. And it, it, this, is this related? The, I, I imagine the glass is no, rigid and this I is think flexible. they're not related because the principle behind this is that they, they sort of print it with like a laser printer or an inkjet printer where they, they, they just coat the, the metallic under whatever circuitry with this, this printer and then they seal it with a, piece, uh, a coating of plastic. This, so, uh, there was recently some guys who made um, keyboards made out of a sheet. It's a sheet of paper yeah. that is a touch keyboard. So, okay. But uh, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else here. Um, yes. Cool. I told you that it wasn't the end of the terminal awesomeness. Something my uh, my lovely wife discovered is a little program called Terminus, um, also hosted on GitHub, like Yorick. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say Yorick. It's J-O-R-1-K, but Yorick, it says beautifully. Anyway, Terminus is also a what looks to be a terminal emulation program. And basically what it does is it teaches the basics of Unix um, to people use in a text-based adventure kind of thing. So how, much, how many Unix commands do you know now? Uh, okay, let me see if I can remember them all. Um, <laughs> So, okay, disclaimer, when I started, I did not know any bash. Um, Then, okay, so they teach you Alice, PWD, uh, CD, MKDIR, RM. um, Grip? Yep, grip. Cat? No, not cat. Cat's there, I'm sure. It must be there. There was no cat. Um, Um, There was touch. Yes, Alice? Uh, yeah, you, I think you said Alice is what you started with. And then do you, maybe you use less instead of cat. So yeah, less. Okay. Uh, and the last one, obviously, was pseudo. 
Okay. So, yeah, it was good fun because you you explore this little adventure world. You move between locations using CD. Um, you can look around and see what's in an area by using Alice. And uh, you can RM objects from the world. Um, they also did copy. Um, CD. Yeah. CP. CP. CP, there we go, CP. And... Uh, so every every room you move into, they teach you another command, or you you interact with someone, and then they teach you something new. But it's like uh, spells. You're learning spells in the world. Uh, I could RM some ugly trolls out of the way, and uh, there was a, an NPC who had whose house had been burnt down, and then you've just learned how to create new objects. So you make him a new house. Um, Touch house. I don't think, yeah, it was okay. t- yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, no, no, no. It was it was a house is a is an area. It's a location. So oh, so it's, it's an MK area. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it was good fun. And at the end of it, you need to find paradise. And then, uh, but you Make can't get into paradise. Yeah, well, you can't get no, but you can't get into paradise without the pseudo password. So you've got to go into the kernel <laughs> files. <laughs> Um, which is nice. like a long slip and slide, and <laughs> no, it was it was good fun, and it took me about an hour and a half, I'd say, to play through the whole thing, and uh, and only then did I find out that I had actually learned all of these. See, I'd always want cool. to start off like the very first thing I'd probably add in is like RM minus RD star to see if it would actually work. <laughs> you delete the world. Yeah. The, the world is very the world is very small, um, actually, and what you can do is quite limited. So there were a couple of quests that you're supposed to be able to do. And I, I, I got through the end of the game and I went back to do these quests and you aren't actually able to do them or I just simply couldn't figure out how to do them. Um, so then I gave up. But by that, and even then, like some, some rooms in the game, pseudo does not work. Um, even though they, when they teach you pseudo, they tell you it's like this uber magical spell and that you have to go defeat the dark wizard it with is. it. And <laughs> yeah, but then you get to a room and you want to do something and it doesn't work. And you go pseudo do that thing and it still doesn't work. And then you're like, well, that was pointless. But it was good fun. Pseudo, make me a sandwich. <laughs> um, Very nice. Yeah. Now I understand those jokes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, the last thing I wanted to touch on in... Haha, touch jokes. Uh, in the Quick Geek is... The story that, that's come up uh, or that's done the rounds in South Africa on Twitter and elsewhere about uh, the digital laser being invented in South Africa. And um, what I wanted to highlight is how not new a story this is. And um, cool. that, the, um, that the MIT Technology Review had written about this on the 5th of February, but that the Department of Science and Technology and Extreme Tech picked it up. And wrote about it, but the Department of Science and Technology only held a press briefing about this this week on Monday, I believe. So that was the 16th of September. Um, so the and difference there is my face palm. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but be that as it may, um, the news is now out in a big way that uh, South Africa also kind of by accident developed this digital laser, and it is significant because um, they explain usually what would happen is you would have two sets of mirrors when uh, in a laser you 'd have a, a rear mirror and a front mirror, and what they 've effectively done is they 've removed the front mirror and replaced it with a liquid crystal display, which you can now control with a computer. And so they are able to change the shape of the laser beam digitally. So they can change like the focal length and the uh, what's it, the wavelength of the laser. I, I think so. And um, okay. and they say that this is going. Uh, this can actually have an effect on photonic telecommunications. Um, so that was okay, definitely cool. going to be my first question to them is, what does this mean for optical networks? And they said, big things. And I'm like, great. So cool. Hopefully we've got... Big things happen. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully we've got some sweet tech coming out of South Africa that, that further revolutionizes um, optical communications networks. Yeah, and if anybody's interested, um, the original paper and abstract um, of the project are available through the Cornell University Library. Yes. And we'll post a link... In IRC Thank right now, not to the Cornell University Library, but to the MIT article, and they link to it directly. And then, as a bit of an aside, I don't think uh, it would be complete to, to without saying this. One of the co-authors of the paper is Igor Litvin. Igor, if you ever come across this, well done. Uh, Igor Litvin 
is a researcher at the at the CSIR who came over, I think, as a, a nuclear physicist or a nuclear scientist. And he was also Annie and my wedding photographer. When we got married five years ago, Igor was the one who <laughs> took our wedding photos. It's a small <laughs> world after all. <laughs> so it was really cool to, uh, to go check out the, the, the article and to see him listed as a co-author. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Good job. That brings us to the end of the Quick Geek. We are going to do a quick run through events you can look forward to. First up, it is International Talk Like a Pirate Day tomorrow, the 19th of September. If you are watching this live, well, you have been informed. If you are not watching this live, well, you've been informed for next year. <laughs> um, missed it. Then National Wills Week, um, just a reminder, is still the 7th to the 11th of October. You can apparently get a will drafted for free by a lawyer during that week. We've got the My Broadband Conference coming up on the 9th of October. Registration is free, um, so go and register. I think it's mybb2013.co.za. Um, we've got Rage coming up. That's the really awesome game expo Rage. from the 4th to the 6th of October 2013. The Nag Land tickets went on sale on the 31st of August, like we warned you multiple times. They sold out again. And How quickly this year? I, I actually don't know. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I don't think there's a way for you to get to the nag land. Um, but Rage is on, and it's going to be awesome. Uh, we'll certainly be there, I think. I do believe we're taking a team to go cover Rage. Uh, we should get some broadcasting on uh, Mindset, and hopefully, because we're doing the editing this year ourselves, we should be able to put it up on our channel too. That's cool. Yeah. And cool. Uh, one last random piece of news. Humble Indie Bundle 9... Um, was released recently. Yes. And they have just added four more games to the Humble Indie Bundle 9. They've added Rocket Birds, Hard Boiled Chicken, a virus named Tom, Bastion, and Limbo. Sorry, five, five games have been added to the Humble Indie Bundle 9. Cool. When does it expire? Uh, da -da 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 -da. I Six days. I do not know. Ends in just one week. Yeah. Cool. That's the best I've got for you. Rad. That's it for the events. And then the final segment of our show, a little thing I like to call What Geekery Is This? A lot of South African news that I slammed in because I have veto powers. Um, pro the first thing Take it away, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about is the Vodacom Neotel deal. And um, for those of you who haven't um, followed this news, uh, there have been a lot of rumors that Vodacom is looking to acquire Neotel. Uh, it started off with rumors that Neotel was for sale, that um, the likes of Dimension Data, MTN, and Vodacom were looking to buy. Oh, yes. And that, uh, that then became that Vodacom is the last person standing in this, okay. in this race. <laughs> and... Um, we then got feedback from um, some uh, regulatory experts to say that there it might be a snag in um, in the deal. Uh, other than the obvious things that people brought up, like the competition commission, the the fact that the competition commission would have to approve this, oh, and would they yeah. ever, yeah. Um, is uh, the fact that the transfer of spectrum licenses, which is one of the things that Vodacom is most assuredly after. In, an, in a Neotel acquisition, is not guaranteed. They have to have the oh, permission of ICASA man. in order to get Neotel Spectrum licenses in order to build the Vodacom's network on Neotel's former Spectrum once it's been, if it's been acquired by... That's quite a gamble there. Yes. Um, and so um, that is, that's simplistically stated. Um, there, there are, I guess I want to call them loopholes, but not quite loopholes. Like if you don't do a full acquisition... Like, I think if there's a change in shareholding, um, just in shareholding and not like a name or a full acquisition, then you don't necessarily have to apply to have the license transferred because it stays uh, under guess. Neotel. Um, but the second the name on the license has to change, you have to ask your CASA permission first, basically, uh, is the gist of it. That's a um, pretty sticky. Yeah. Um, so, um, and so uh, I wanted to mention this to spark some conversation in IRC. I know um, if Paul Hewlett is still around, I know it's a bit late. 
uh, and he might have actually uh, he's still here rushed off. Okay, cool. Um, he's he's weighed in on the topic quite uh, quite uh, quite a lot uh, while we've been covering it, and so I thought we'd stir the pot a little and have have ourselves a conversation. IRC, if anybody wants to weigh in on the thing, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Do you think it's anti-competitive? Do you think a Vodacom plus Neotel acquisition? Um, will be able to compete more effectively with Telcom, which is what I think. But what does that mean for the competition in just the mobile space? MTN, uh, Cell C. I would say, what's the big picture? Yeah, I would. I would just say, if Telcom is allowed to exist as a both fixed line operator with a mobile arm, then I don't see what could possibly be wrong with Neotel Vodacom because they would be effectively um, able to compete. With the whole telecom no, consolidation. No, well, no, no, they could compete with one another. Uh, but who else could compete? Uh, well, yeah. at the moment, no one can compete with telecom yes. in yeah. that space. So, I, so d- I don't see how it's anti-competitive. It's actually the and, opposite. And, it is and if I were, yeah. if, uh, if I were, I don't know how much legal weight this has, but uh, certainly an argument I would put forward is, even if Vodacom acquires Neotel, it still gets zero copper. Telcom still controls all the last mile copper in the country. So oh, wow. you're still not really competing with Telcom in that space. What you get is Neotel's um, uh, metro fiber footprint, which is pretty cool. Um, and you get their extensive spectrum. Um, uh, and to be fair, you get Neotel's existing business. Like sure. as a business, it's an attractive buyer regardless. But um, I have it on fairly good authority that Vodacom really, really, really wants the spectrum um, at, to use for its own network. It doesn't want to run Neotel on the side and, and, and have them sort of operate like a separate network that Vodacom can then uh, so they'll buy just access to. that on. whole business and make it their own. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and uh, especially be able to build Vodacom towers um, and roll out uh, base stations using... Neotel, former Neotel Spectrum. And if they don't get that, they, they're probably not interested in buying. Um, so if they can't get some sort of guarantee that that will go through, then the word I have is they probably just won't go for it. Um, so uh, let's, um, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Paul Hill says he's going to give it a skip. But some comments from RSC. If Vodacom by Neotel, then Vodacom would not touch the residential market. Vodacom want the spectrum and the backhaul fiber. Nothing stops Vodacom and MTN and Celsius from running fixed networks. That is correct. Um, and uh, so some, some already quite, quite a bit of uh, uh, interesting discussion from RSC. Um, <laughs> CZC chimes in and says, good, because all of this trenching activity uh, in order to lay fiber is making road running really difficult for him. And, uh, and so something that I've, I've told people is that, for example, if I were the competition commission in this case, um, I would actually ask the relevant parties, in this case, um, most assuredly ICASA uh, among them, Bef- you know, when considering this case, okay, now Vod- Vodacom is going to get a whole bunch of spectrum from Neotel. Yeah. What is Ecasa going to do um, with the rest of the wireless spectrum that the mobile operators are after? They're after 2600. They are, um, um, MTN has recently lodged an application for 2 gigahertz, more 2 gigahertz spectrum. And then there's the 800 megahertz digital dividend spectrum. Now, very importantly, if Vodacom get Neotel and the license is transferred, they get a chunk of 800 megahertz spectrum. That is something ah. they are definitely after. And if um, Vodacom gets exclusive access to that, um, that, that could be something that well worth considering. And so um, if before letting a deal like this go through, I would get some sort of um, indication from ICASA that the other mobile network operators will be given favor so that they can compete effectively with Vodacom, who will have this seems reasonable, like yeah. huge amount of spectrum at their disposal now if they get a hold of Neotel. The twin evil forces of poor USB handling and poor cable routing have conspired against us to ruin our camera angle. So we're going to do the show like this from Over here Over the in. shoulder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Third person style. Um, this is the mixer view of the studio. <laughs> <laughs> and with
with that, I'm going to, while the IRC is mulling over the Vodacom Neotel deal discussion, I'm going to uh, take us into OpenView HD. And my question is, is it remotely a big deal? Um, for those of you who haven't followed the story, OpenView HD is a free-to-air satellite broadcaster. And uh, that, what that means is you pay once off for dish installation and decoder, and then you never, ever pay again. And they've stated this categorically numerous times to, because that seems to be a message that is not getting across because people in South Africa have this image of satellite TV being a paid for service. Um, we're only used to paid TV, satellite TV. So yes. this concept of a free thing is like, oh, it's just a, it's just a loss leader. It's just a, it's just a thing. And then in future, I will pay. They will say, sure. and, and OpenView HD have said, no, no. OpenView as a service, OpenView as a uh, platform will remain free for as long as it's running. Um, so, uh, but that being said, I mean, how, how do they propose about making money? Okay, so this is where things get interesting and maybe a little complicated. So let's keep okay. it simple. The simple answer to that that they've provided is that they charge money for carriage. So they carry, um, they've, they've announced 16 channels on the service to, to launch with. Um, they've got the standard free-to-air channels, SABC 1, 2, 3, then five channels from ETV. So not only uh, ETV itself, which will be broadcast in HD for the first time only on OpenView. Uh, it's like their big draw card. Oh, you can get HD ETV only on OpenView. Um, but four other channels. And, and um, while we were busy sorting out the camera, you mentioned a movie channel, E-Movies. Yes, E-movies. They've got a kids' animation channel called e tunes They've got uh, eCarsi, which is like an, an, an African content channel, uh, which they say will not just be an African content channel. It'll be an African content channel with a difference. Um, and okay. then uh, I have a lost... Zest TV. Zest TV. ASTV. Which is an Afrikaans channel. Okay. Uh, DTV. Oh, STF, yeah. yeah. DTV, I think, which uh, is a... Dean, which yeah. a Dean TV, I think, is a religious channel. Um, then they've got e, e, uh, Africa. Then they've got Mindset Learning, Da Vinci Learning, both educational channels. Apparently, Da Vinci Learning is a documentary channel. That ought to be interesting. Then English Club, which is not football. Um, it is another educational channel. And then two religious channels, Spirit Word and Inspiration TV. Um, I think the Da Vinci Learning channel would have had a way cooler name if it was just called Da Vinci. <laughs> and um, so two big things that are missing from the lineup right now. Um, mo most important, I think, to them is news. They've got Correct. no dedicated news channels. And second most important to the people of South Africa is sports Sport. channels. <laughs> All right, so they don't have any sports channels. Um, but, and here's where I'm going to argue about what the real significance of OpenView is, is it, it's not, the, the content is hopefully something they can rectify over time. As um, exclusivity agreements lapse, um, uh, and so on, they can pick up other channels that, that people might want, sports channels, news channels, and so on. Um, their model is completely different to what we're used to with multi-choice and top TV. Multi-choice and top TV, as they run today, um, basically control the whole ecosystem. So they control the decoder, they strike the deals with the, uh, the vendors and the installers. Yeah. Um, there is like some competition and some... Uh, Movement in that space, um, but they, you know, they, they it sounds very cutthroat there. Yeah, um, th those guys fight hard with one another, yeah. um, and but multi choice. But it comes down to multi choice and top TV. Not only get the content, they also supply the set top boxes. They also um, deal with a the customer. They handle the back office systems, the whole nine yards. Open View is not operating that way. Okay, all it is doing is getting the content. And then it specifies the minimum specification for the decoder needed to access that content. And from there, the ball is in the vendor's courts. They've got four agreements in place right now. Ellie's, Space TV, and then two newcomers called Switch Digital and ABT, not ADT, the security company. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Um, and each of these guys can do their own decoder. So they had an Ellie's box on display today at the press briefing. But effectively you as the vendor can now build your own package. You can sort of build Ellie's satellite television with your own decoder, okay. but you're showing OpenView's content. Um, 
And okay, uh, and I didn't answer your question fully. I just yeah, realized. Yeah, yeah. All right, so they charge carriage. They charge money for carriage. That's going to be Platco, the the platform operators. Okay. Uh, primary source of income. So the person who pretty much puts OpenView together is Platco, and that's how they're going to derive their money. That's how they're going to basically have to turn a profit. How much do they charge for carriage? Uh, that is not known. They also charge a, a small royalty uh, on the decoders, but it's like a random box. So that's not at all income. If someone would like to sponsor us money, we can put together Let's Talk TV <laughs> and run our own channel. Yay! Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, yes good plan. Um, we know someone who might be able to tell us, <laughs> but completely <laughs> off the record, uh, yeah, what, uh, what they charge for carriage. Now, here's where things get interesting. Platco is the sister company to ETV. Okay. So ETV and Platco are both owned by a holding company. Um, one of the primary shareholders of uh, w which is Sabido Investments. Um, and um, the channels who are now paying for carriage on OpenView would obviously want to derive some sort of income from, I mean, you can't just pay for carriage for peace and charity. Yes. And so they would derive their income from advertising. Okay. Now, so you, one can then argue that the net result of this will be ETV puts together a platform launches a platform, charges carriage on it so that it doesn't run at a loss, but then makes the majority of its income off of charging advertising money on its ETV channels. Okay, and it all funnels enough. into the same company, yes. into the same holding company. So while um, Platco and ETV are separate companies, all their profits eventually get spun up into the same holding company. So that's you can't argue with business logic. Yeah, yeah. yeah so th that's th that's where I would say that's the that's the more involved and, and intricate answer. I would beg to differ. You can argue with business logic, <laughs> but you won't. Says go there. the business analyst in the room. <laughs> um, all right. So what I wanted to touch on and an, ala an, an analogy. It's it's a it's maybe not the best <laughs> analogy, but us broadband heads, right? Yeah. An easy analogy for us to understand in the current paradigm of South Africa is that OpenView and Platco are doing what internet solutions did decades ago. Decades? 20 years. Yeah, two decades ago. Wow. Um, in that they are launching a platform for other companies to build businesses out of. So, for example, internet solutions competed with telecom. Yes. Out of them sprung the, the vibrant ISP space. Not, a, not only them, other ISPs also bought... Um, transit or bought access from SAIX. So you have these two players in the market, SAIX and Internet Solutions. That's why the an analogy isn't perfect because multi-choice and, and, and on-digital media, DSTV and Top TV, do not allow any sort of wholesale access to, its, their, to their services. Nothing, yeah. But Platco does. So it's almost like a, like a CCOM cable. It's this open access thing that anybody who wants to be a vendor well, you, on... You've said it before. It's a platform. Yeah. And so anybody who wants to be a service provider can be. So yes. now you've got Ellie's who, who have a box. Now, to my mind, the software in that box is under the control of Ellie's, not OpenView. So Ellie's can brand that box Ellie's. They can, okay. they can pretty much brand the whole experience Ellie's. Um, Space TV can do the same thing. Switch Digital, ABT, they can all do the same thing. And, and there can be vibrant competition, just like there is vibrant competition between AfriHost and Web Africa and um, OpenWeb and all these guys that are competing with one another for customers in the ADSL space. Yes. So too can there now be in the satellite TV space. Now, where the analogy breaks down horribly, <laughs> unfortunately, is that the internet is a completely open system. Any third party can host content okay. on the internet, yeah. and as long as you've got some like a, a URL that can resolve to that thing, people can access it. Satellites, unfortunately, are a little more complicated. You have to buy space on a satellite. You have to have a spectrum license to broadcast in a country, um, and and so on. So there, there there are a lot of not there are a lot of other costs involved. Barrier to entry, is but, um, yeah, but also not the costs, but the, the limitations on who can provide content. So um, the 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 person who provides access um, must also, uh, you know, make sure that there's content for the 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 people providing the retail experience to be able to deliver to customers. So that to me is the the real um, what I'm the the big deal. Yes, yes, yes. Um, behind OpenView is that um, it. It turns the whole satellite TV thing 
what we've known about satellite TV, it turns it on its head. It tries something different because we've seen Top TV did not succeed. We'll see if now that they've been bought out by the Chinese company Star Times, if they can make a go of it. Um, but basically trying to compete head on with DSTV did not work. Maybe this okay. will. I can see why you're excited. <laughs> <laughs> Is what it comes down yep. to. Uh, and uh, with that... I would like to take us into our kicker. We always end the show on something fun. And I have no idea who this comes from, but I think we've all watched it throughout the week. It's a little video called This Is Japan World Cup 3. If you're listening to the audio podcast, all you have to do is Google those words. This is Japan World Cup 3 and, link to the f- and click on the first YouTube link. If you are watching the video thing and you're looking at the screenshot and going, what is this? That is the That's correct, what I'm having right now. That is the correct <laughs> reaction. Go and watch this video. Um, this has spawned a whole bunch of links becoming popular on the internet, including <laughs> how American ski jump is according to the Japanese. Now, it's a bit of a spoiler, but to sort of whet your appetite for this. <laughs> what, <laughs> what happens is the Americans um, uh, ride on the, uh, on the skis to a piece. Or something like that. Then they slide down the ski ramp and there is a baby involved. And while (laughs) then while the one American is jumping, ski jumping through the air, the other American is down back and uh, down at the back on the ski ramp still. And he throws the baby in a uh, American football style twirling towards the guy ski jumping. The guy ski jumping catches the baby and then promptly scores a touchdown. It just reminds me of all of those <laughs> mad Japanese game shows that you've probably come across links to on the web. Some those are so fun to watch, <laughs> but I have one word. What? Yeah, <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, I think pretty much anything you can uh, Google with Japan and how they see the West sports <laughs> comes out fairly entertaining. <laughs> Actually, Pyro has the best comment in IRC. (laughs) 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 D-A-F-U-Q. Good job. With that, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We'll hopefully see you this time next week if we can get our cameras working again. Uh, If you've stuck with us in uh, in the IRC, in the live stream, thank you so much. And we'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. Where do they find us, Jan? All right, so they can find us at... Uh, live.letstalknetwork.tv is where the live broadcast is. Let's Talk Geek, you can find it at ltg.letstalknetwork.tv. And me, you can find it at mybroadband.co.za or at YanVZ on Twitter. Where can people find you? I am on Twitter, FRK, yeah. Look up for me there. Cool. Annie, where can people find you? <laughs> Inside the camera. <laughs> I am at AnnieBugZA <laughs> on Twitter. Cool bananas. Thank you so much for joining me for the show t- today, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody at home, for joining us. We'll see you again.